Okay, and good afternoon, good morning. Welcome to the Japanese American Citizens League Play Ball, the Japanese American Experience and the National Pastime. Thank you so much for coming today and spending a little bit of your Saturday with us for this program. Um, we're really excited to see our members join us, but also folks from around the country and the general public. Um, it's really exciting to put this program together. So we hope that you will enjoy the conversation that we'll have and some of the photos and you know some of the stories that we're gonna be sharing um, in this program. I am Saki Mori, and I serve as the, as the National Vice President of Membership for the Japanese American Citizens League National Board, as well as the Interim President for the New York City Chapter Board. The Japanese American Citizen League is also known as JACL, and it is the organization that is the oldest and largest Asian American civil rights organization in the United States. The JACL monitors and responds to issues that enhance or threaten the civil and human rights of all Americans and implement strategies to affect positive social change, particularly to the Asian Pacific American community. The JCL is a national organization whose ongoing mission is to secure and maintain the civil rights of Japanese Americans and all others who are victimized by injustice and bigotry. The leaders and members of the JCL also work to promote cultural, educational, and social values and preserve the heritage and legacy of the Japanese American community. As the Japanese American community celebrates the collective Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, we at the JACL are excited to present a program that will speak to the history, impact, present and future of baseball within the Japanese American community. This year also marks the 150th anniversary of baseball's introduction to Japan. And today we, we see Japanese nationals and Japanese Americans make their mark in Major League Baseball. We also want to honor Secretary Norman Y. Mineta today, who passed away earlier this week. Secretary Mineta was a trailblazer for the Japanese American community and the Asian American community and beyond. He was the first Asian American cabinet member, first serving under President Clinton and then later President Bush. He was a 10 term congressman, a former mayor, a champion for Japanese American redress and campaigned for the passage of the ADA. It was during his time as Secretary of Transportation under President Bush that Secretary Mineta shared his story of incarceration as a 10-year-old boy at Heart Mountain, Wyoming. That helped shape the response by President Bush and others following the September 11th attacks. Through all his work and leadership, he was a true support, supporter and cherished friend of the JACL. It is fitting that we can celebrate his life and legacy through a program on baseball, which was, which was a beloved sport for him and was by his side through his time as mayor, congressman, and cabinet secretary. Today at 5 p.m. Eastern, the Mineta family will have a special announcement on Zoom. We will include a link in the chat um, if you are interested in RSVPing for the event. And now I introduce Bill Staples Jr., who will be this program's moderator and will introduce our panelists. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's an honor to be here, real privilege. Um, Carrie and I, Carrie Nakagawa is a good friend of mine. And we often talk about the synergies involved in this wonderful game and the history and telling the story and wonderful synergy that we have here today. Uh, I am an author, my name is Bill Staples. I've written a book about Kenichi Zanamira, who is the great grandfather of Brandon Zanamira on our panel. That book has a foreword written by Don Wakamatsu. And that book wouldn't have been written if it wasn't for the great work of Kariyo Nakagawa, who I think is one of the most important baseball historians, not just Japanese American baseball historians. So we have a wonderful panel here today, uh, wonderful uh, energy and, and friendship. And we're gonna talk about some very important topics and very important history that not many people know about and uh, really looking forward to it. I would like to point out though, uh, I did get a chance to meet uh, Norman Mineta. And we talked about baseball. I spoke with him about 15, 20 minutes in 2019, and I'll share some of the details around that. But how fortunate were we that the universe put him in that place and time in 2001 for him to be in the cabinet with President George Bush. And it's really interesting that we would have that connection because for me, let me go to the next slide. If it wasn't for 9-11, I don't think I would be here. That was really kind of the connection that got me started with this history. Just let me give you a little bit of background. So 2003, I moved to Chandler, Arizona, right next door to the Gila River Indian community. I'm a youth baseball coach in addition to all my other passions. And I thought it'd be uh, worthwhile to coach on the Gila River Indian community. So I do a Google search 
for Gila River in baseball. I don't see anything about coaching opportunities, but I see this fascinating home plate. And it says artifact on loan from the Japanese American Citizens League, the Midori Hall family, Masa Noshita, and the Nisei Baseball Research Project. Now, prior to this, I had studied a lot of Negro League baseball history, thought I knew a lot about baseball. I didn't know anything about Japanese American baseball history. So I figured if I didn't, there were probably others out there who didn't as well. But the one thing that really drew me in was thinking about the time and place where we were as a country. This is 2004 now. Uh, it's a few years after 9-11. Uh, Anti-Muslim sentiment is really high, and I see that as a nation, we are at strong risk of repeating history. And I know it's a very important message for the JCL, excuse me, JCL community as well, making sure that we learn from this, uh, the historic incarceration so something like that doesn't happen again. And on a personal level, I know that it's a story about Japanese Americans being incarcerated, but I also felt it was a timeless and shared human condition story. All of us, to some degree, we're, we were less free and less happy than we used to be. And so I wanted to seek that wisdom. And I found this gentleman by the name of Kenichi Zenimura, and his story was fascinating, and it really resonated with me, and it drew me in. So that's how this story got started. And I think it's fitting that all stories or the game of baseball begins at home plate. Uh, we'll see where this story goes, but I think home plate might uh, wrap it up at the end as well. All right. Uh, I can share with you, though, I didn't know about the JCL as well. And through this entire journey of doing the research, getting involved in the community, it's been nothing but inviting and welcoming. And I've met so many wonderful people. And to my surprise, I am now the president of the Arizona chapter of the JACL. In addition to that, this, the name you see here, Masa Noshita, he used to be the caretaker for Zenimura's home plate, making sure that it was taken care of and, and well-preserved and well-displayed wherever it went, we went. Uh, I am now honored as the caretaker of Zenimura's home plate. So. Uh, with that, I uh, just want to give you a little bit about my background and how the story resonated with me, because this really is not just about Japanese American baseball history. This is U.S. history. This is our history, and it needs to be preserved and shared and celebrated, and that's what we're doing here today. All right. So with that, uh, I'd like to talk about um, today's event and how it's going to be organized. So we have it uh, broken down into three parts. Oh, this, uh, this is just a famous image of Zenimira with Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and other Nisei pioneers who we're going to learn about uh, throughout this conversation. But today's event is going to be broken down into three uh, parts. We're going to educate the audience here about Japanese American baseball history. We're going to celebrate the accomplishments to date, uh, everything in terms of uh, Major League Baseball and other opportunities. And then we're going to talk about advocate uh, future opportunities to increase diversity, equity, inclusion for Asian Americans in all levels of the national pastime. So there's no shortage of topics here today, just a shortage of time. So we better get right into it, right? Yeah. All right. So, but just like the game of baseball, we need to warm up. We don't want to get injured jumping in too quick. So we thought we'd start with a fun question for everybody. Uh, if you could just share with the audience how you got involved in the game, your passion, and I'd just like to give a quick 60 second uh, example for me, and then we'll pass it on to our other panelists, okay? So for myself, love for baseball is in my DNA. My great grandfather played 100 years ago in the New York, New Jersey League, uh, played against some great Negro League pioneers, it was interracial baseball back then. I don't have a favorite team, I just love the game of baseball, but I've had to pick, it would be a year. The 1980 Houston Astros taught me how to love baseball as a kid. And watching that team play, there was a guy on the other side of the field named Pete Rose who taught me how to play on the field, only on the field though, <laughs> not off the field. Uh, and then with that, I just wanna share that I'm a player, coach, uh, historian, and a fan. My first autograph was Stan the Man Musial. My last autograph was Ichiro. And um, I had a good fortune of playing five years in a fantasy camp league where one of our panels here today was my teammate, Kerio Nakagawa great pitcher and shortstop in his own right. All right, I'll stop there. So, Kerry, you want to take it from here? Thank you, Bill. Uh, you know, first off, uh, I want to welcome everybody and, and congratulate uh, everyone on Asian American Heritage Month. Uh, you know, this is, uh, I'm honored to be in everyone's presence. Uh, 
you know, I wanted to thank so much Bridget, David, Alexander, Matthew, uh, all the panelists. Um, I got a quick Norman Etta story I wanted to share. Um, we were uh, board members with the National Japanese American uh, Site to Patriotism in Washington, D.C., and I remember him sharing how uh, as a Cub Scout, he took in his favorite bat into the camp and one of the guards confiscated it. And he was a great, great passion for baseball. And then many years later as a Congressman, he uh, received a bat of his two favorite players, Hank Aaron and Sadaharo, the two home run champions. And uh, one of his aides told him that because of the value, uh, he couldn't keep it. So the two favorite bats of his life were confiscated, but the happy ending is when he retired, he uh, he was given his bat by Hank Aaron, signed, and Sadahara O. Oh, and uh, I just appreciate all of Norm uh, the Manettas and family's uh, contribution to our amazing history. And that's why we're here today, this month, celebrating Asian American Heritage Month. And uh, the panelists, uh, we go back, uh, Don Wakamatsu in 1997, when our exhibit was at the Phoenix Hall of Fame Museum, uh, along with my godpapa, Pat Morita on the symposium panel. Don was our catcher and uh, uh, Step Tomoka threw out the first pitch to open up our exhibit. Uh, so back in 1997, uh, Brandon Zenimura, uh, his great grandpa Kenichi and my uncle Johnny who uh, go back to the 1919s, the early 1920s. Uh, our families go back that many generations. And to see Brandon and my son as little leaguers uh, grow up and now he's a father of two, uh, uh, it's, it's just amazing. It's, it's kind of like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. When I see our panelists, you know, I, uh, I see these wonderful faces. Uh, Bill Staples in 2003 uh, invited me to do a book signing in Fort Myers, Myers Florida for fantasy baseball. baseball. Yeah. And so I got the pitch and uh, on a critical game and my own only <laughs> few nights where I was a pitcher, I played shortstop most of the time. Uh, Bill went five for five and I threw a shutout and helped me get the MVP award from one of my heroes as a kid, the uh, human vacuum cleaner, uh, Brooks Robinson. So to have Don and, and Brandon and, and Bill uh, as our moderator, uh, I'm just so appreciative and, and to the National Japanese uh, American Citizen. All right. Really, thank you. Don, can you share your 60 second inspiration? Your, you got started. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks for having me on. I'm honored to be here. And uh, again, uh, thrilled to be on this panel with all you guys. Uh, my, my career started way back uh, when I was eight years old playing JACL baseball youth program in, in uh, Alameda, California. That kind of started me on uh, baseball, watching Lenny Cicada as a, as a young role model and then watching Nomo and uh, some of the younger players. Went on to fortunately be uh, get a scholarship at Arizona State, played with Barry Bonds and some great legendary players there, Oda B. McDowell. Uh, end up uh, playing a total of about uh, 12 seasons, mostly in the minor leagues, one in the major leagues with the Chicago White Sox. Uh, went on to a, a, an 18-year professional uh, coaching career at the major league level and all I've been with 15 different major league clubs, uh, either in the minor league or major leagues, been uh, fortunate to win two world series with the Anaheim angels and the Kansas city Royals and uh, spent a total of 36 years, fortunately to be able to travel around, meet some phenomenal people and uh, just recently retired. Thank you for sharing. Brandon. Uh, to say where it started, um, the picture that's kind of up right now, that was, a that was kind of a token on the wall. Uh, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents and my great grandmother. Um, and so as, as a child, I looked up to this picture and great grandma would always say, yeah, great grandpa was pretty good. Played, played with that guy. Um, and for the longest time, you know, the idea of Babe Ruth, the, the magnitude, the, uh, the dream uh, in some ways was to be as legendary, as, uh, impactful as, uh, you know, it, we watched the movie, the Sandlot and, and the Colossus of clout, uh, the, every name that the great Bambino, the, the every name and every legend that kind of comes with that. Um, and so in, um, in process of thinking about where it started, that's probably where it started. Baseball kind of started there for me. Um, and I, to say that baseball has 
kind of run through the veins a bit. Uh, probably my most memorable moment and, and one that uh, I hold pretty high, pretty high is uh, being 15 years old. Uh, we, I played for grandpa on his USA, Fresno USA baseball team. Uh, got a chance to play the opening game of the international tournament for the, uh, for the boys league in, in Osaka, Japan. And we played the opening game in the Osaka dome. Um, after the game, uh, we got to see uncle Kenji. So the two boys that were here in the United States, which was my grandfather, Kenzo <laughs> Kenji, um, well, grandpa was there with me, with grandma, and then uh, for Uncle Kenji there to be there and Auntie Suhako to watch me play in the Osaka Dome in Japan uh, was just if, one of those memories beyond belief that uh, he got the chance to watch me play there. Nice. Thank you for sharing. Hey, uh, Carrie, uh, I'd like to uh, start with you when it comes to the opportunity to talk about the education and what Brandon just touched on there, the dynamics of the family being separated. I'm sure when we talk about wartime, maybe we can touch on that dynamic as well. Sure. It's, it's, uh, it was probably more common than most people know uh, in terms of families maybe being separated uh, during that wartime. So with that, uh, if you could take us uh, through the journey of this important history. What are the top things we need to know? Um, well, just just like Brandon had mentioned, I, I kind of like to backtrack a little bit with that image with uh, my uncle Johnny and and Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth, Kenichi Zenimura, Fred Yoshikawa, Harvey Iwata. Uh, as a kid, I was like, you know, eight years old. And I remember this photo like Brandon saw with his grandparents' house uh, it hung on our wall. And for me to ask my uncle Johnny, who was like the Nisei, uh, uh, Shohei Otani or Babe Ruth. He was a left-handed pitcher. He uh, was a home run hitter and he was a center fielder and hit 377 against the all-stars of the uh, the black all-stars in the Negro Leagues. And um, at the time, all these players, they had the four tools, they had the uh, passion, but they just, because of the Jim Crow, Crow laws of the times, couldn't play Major League Baseball. So they had to play in leagues of their own. So I, I really wanted to, um, you know, as a kind of the DNA being in our, our family. My uncle, my grandfather, Hisotaro, uh, went from Hiroshima, Japan to the big island of Ola and played on a plantation team of uh, the Puna sugarcane plantation. And then in 1886 came to the mainland and my dad threw a nine inning no hitter for his Carruthers high school uh, uh, baseball team. And my uncle Johnny became the uh, Nisei Babe Ruth as early as making tours in 1924 and 27 and 1937. Having an uncle like Uncle Lefty in 37 pitch against Jackie Robinson, uh, Santa Maria Junior High versus Pasadena Junior High. He gave up two home runs to Jackie, but he always felt that he helped Jackie's career and gave him a lot of confidence. Uh, having Uncle Moss play on the 1937 tour, uh, the Alamina Kono All-Stars, they went to Japan, Korea, and Manchukuo, China. Uh, so baseball has been in our DNA, uh, you know, for many generations, at least four now. Uh, my son, uh, I, I was an All-Star shortstop. My son was an All-Star catcher. And our uh, Gose, uh, you know, will the thrill. Hopefully, if he takes it up, uh, he'll carry it on for five generations. But uh, as you mentioned, Bill, the three most important takeaways, I think, for education is these early tours of these uh, Issei and Nisei teams, as early as the Seattle Asahi in 1914, they went to uh, this, they started this bridge across the Pacific. And then they went back in 1918. They went back in 1921. Uh, the Fresno Athletic Club went up in 24 with the San Jose Asahis. And in 1928, the Stockton Yamatos. And then in 1931, the uh, Los Angeles Nippons. And in 1927, the Philadelphia Royal Giants, an all-black, uh, you know, team of the Negro Leagues, uh, went and uh, faced Fresno in front of 10,000 fans. And um, so, to to have these kind of dynamics of the early tours, I think, is so important because great players of today, like Otani San and Ichiro San, who will be uh, probably a first-time enshrinement in 2025, they're really the godfathers. These early Nisei and Nisei uh, ball players to the great players from 
uh, Asia and Japan that you see today on the major league rosters. Uh, I think number two is the, to see how important it was that the uh, uh, Issei and Nisei and the black teams uh, in the teens and 20s uh, going on these tours. And um, the media used to always say the, the Nisei and Issei were too small to play major league baseball, but you never hear that about Jose Altuve or many of the major leaguers of today, Ichiro, of course, and um, you know, they, we, they would label them as the little brown men or the little yellow men. And so the thing that, you know, we always want to point out is that it wasn't about size, you know, the, uh, the size factor uh, shouldn't even have been an issue. Uh, I think the third most important is that, you know, they, they had to play in leagues of their own. And so for all the ones that came after them, you know, they really are standing uh, on their shoulders and, uh, with all the future enshrinements that you'll see in the future, I hope that uh, they get this is an introduction to our history so that they realize that they have gotten the torch passed on to them. They're standing on the shoulders and these are early tours uh, really were their godfathers. So these are the kind of the three takeaways that I'd like to share. And um, so even though it started with like kind of with Brandon and and uh, Kale as little little leaguers, I didn't want them to them to uh, ever have to uh, not realize how important the impact their great grandfathers were. And so, with uh, panels like today, I, I think we can further the education and to celebrate and to advocate. Uh, so, hopefully, Major League Baseball and the National Baseball Hall of Fame will include our story and our heroes and uh, future enshrinements uh, in the future. Hey, Gary, can you speak to how that uh, passion and love for baseball was carried into the uh, camps during World War II? Well, the, you know, when, when you think about baseball starting in, in America in 1839 in Cooperstown and Japan uh, getting started in 1872, and because of these early tours, professional baseball in 1936 starts in Japan with pro ball. But, you know, to have uh, so many players that had the passion, had the had the tools, but um, they just didn't get the opportunity. And then we go into World War II and America imprisons their own Americans only because of the race. So we had many players that were ready to make that leap, but because of World War II had to play in the camps, uh, making tours, uh, ironically, uh, like Gila River, Arizona could go to Heart Mountain, Wyoming for a baseball tournament and Amachi, Colorado could come to Gila River. If you had a person that a uh, loved one that passed away, you couldn't leave the camps. Uh, they had barbed wire, they had guard towers, uh, but they took away everything that was American uh, from them. Uh, but instead of rejecting the American pastime, even though they took away their radios, their cameras, the, their foreign language for the Issei, they couldn't even practice their faith. And most of the uh, incarceration or concentration camps they let them play baseball and instead of rejecting it you know they had 32 teams three divisions at Gila River Arizona alone at Minidoka Idaho they built 13 baseball diamonds uh, women played softball the men had their uh, inner camp tours but I think it was a tonic it was an elixir for the community for for the fans to you know where would you rather be in a 20 by 100 barracks surrounded uh, by a rope in quadrants and with no privacy or going out in that 120 degrees searing heat and see cheer on your favorite team or your favorite uh, players and so it, it really became um, uh, quite a uh, in abnormal times it brought a sense of normalcy uh, i remember uh, a great writer dave davis wrote an article for sports illustrated it said it was fields in the desert that felt like home and so I think for the mothers to make their uniforms out of mattress ticking and, and to, uh, for players, community, uh, line sometimes nine deep uh, to play their community teams. The, the irony, uh, as you see in this one photo, uh, Arkansas A&M came into the Arkansas Jerome camp and got beat shut out by Moon Karima six to zero. Um, you see the Heart Mountain and the Gila River All-Stars doing inner camp uh, you know, exchanges. So, uh, so many dynamics and so little know about it. 70% of this country still uh, aren't aware that Japanese Americans were incarcerated. So I think through the prism of baseball, 
Uh, and like an onion, onions get hooked, hooked both uh, genders with baseball. Uh, and then as like an onion, as we unravel it, we can get into a lot more serious issues, uh, which we'll do today. So um, thank you for asking, Bill. Yeah. Can you speak to the post-war experience? Post Post-war experience, you know, was 10 years of resettlement. Uh, most Japanese Americans were still considered enemy aliens. Uh, to see uh, so many great Hawaiian ball players like Wally Yonamine, uh, who was like the Jackie Robinson for us in Japan, who was pelted with coins, was, was told to go home, uh, Gaijin Yonamine. And he really knew that if he failed, then other future ball players that went to Japan would have a hard go at it. So. He uh, hung in there. I mean, he drank miso soup three times a day on the train. Uh, he was the last one out of the tunnel uh, to take the field. And yet for the Tokyo Giants, he helped them win four world championships. And uh, he actually was one of the little kids. Uh, uh, there was a, a kid holding down a baseball from the uh, Tokyo Giants and all the players ignored him. And Wally as the last person signed it and that little kid, you turned out to be Sadahara O. So how important one signature meant to a future Hall of Famers. Uh, this picture of Joe DiMaggio on, on the end is uh, Kenshi Zenimura, Brandon's uh, great grandfather's brother. And, you know, he helped, uh, you know, interpret and translate. Uh, he was a two-time All-Star for Hiroshima Carp. Uh, he was an All-Star at Fresno State. Uh, Joe was on his honeymoon with Marilyn Monroe when this picture was taken and he was giving batting clinics. and. Um, uh, you see Fibber Hirayama with Casey Stingle, uh, again, from Fresno and uh, from a small town in Exeter and was Casey's translator. He asked him uh, if you could translate for Casey. And after listening to Casey talk, he said, well, hell, I, I can't even understand him. But Fibber became a 10-time All-Star for the Hiroshima Carp. And this was a community team that wasn't sponsored by big corporations. And so it really lifted the spirit of the people in Hiroshima after the devastation of the atomic bomb. And Fibber was such, he was playing center field and a lot of times would beat the second baseman into the dugout and just uh, was an amazing, he knocked himself out cold hitting the cement wall one time as a player and later would go on to be the coach and scout for the Hiroshima carp in the Dominican Republic and found a uh, a young kid from the Dominican uh, shortstop and referred him to the uh, parent club in Japan, the Hiroshima Carp, and it turned out to be future Major League All-Star Alfonso Soriano. So uh, these are the post-war uh, images I like to talk about and their impact. And then we get into uh, the 70s, you know, it doesn't, it takes, you know, uh, Ryan Kurosaki uh, with the Cardinals and Len Sakata to win a World Series with the Orioles in 1983. And we have amazing legacy players like Don Wakamatsu starting with the Dodgers and, um, you know, catching uh, the, the butterfly uh, ball from Charlie Huff with the Chicago White Sox. And, and then we have, uh, you know, future legacy players like Onan Masaoka from Hilo, Hawaii, and our guy, our guy Noriyuki Pat Morita, who would love to sing the national anthem. Uh, at all the major league ballparks with the Dodgers, the Giants, the Diamondbacks, the Sacramento Kings. And he'd been, he's been around the world four or five times, but he would always tell me, yo, man, he goes, I sing the national anthem because this is the greatest country in the world. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. So I sing that song because I love this country, despite, you know, being led by an FBI agent on the train after I got out, uh, of a sanitarium as an 11-year-old to Gila River, Arizona, and to, uh, you know, be able to, to sing this song. And despite what our communities and our families went through, uh, we, and the blemishes, you know, that this country has uh, imposed upon us, we still, uh, I sing that song because I love it. And so he had a little blues riff when he would sing it. So uh, for us to do a documentary together, he was a uh, my writer and uh, I produced and directed it, but he would always say that Issei, Sansei, Yonsei, Gosei, uh, if we don't preserve this Japanese American baseball history, it's all going to be about no say. Uh, and he was so right. So in spirit, he's always with us. And, and so was all our legacy players. Thank you, Kerry. Hey, if I could, I'd like to just add a few more uh, historical facts to reinforce some points. Uh, 
the uh, the statement that if given the opportunity, could Japanese Americans have played Major League Baseball pre-war? You had touched on the games between the Negro Leaguers and the Japanese American teams. Mm -hmm. I just want to point out to everybody, uh, just so we're connecting the dots, Major League Baseball recently, excuse me, recently recognized the stats and the players of the Negro Leagues as being Major League equivalent. So now when we have that conversation, we see this wonderful box score from 1928 of Johnny Nakagawa going five for five against two Negro League pitchers, Bill Holland and, and Pud Flournoy was his name. We now see that Johnny Nakagawa could hit Major League level talent pitching. So I think that's really important that we reinforce that message. Then the other one, just a quick wartime story, uh, Jack Kakauchi, who was a soldier, Japanese American, who had played with the LA Nippon before the war, He's playing with the Camp Grant team in Illinois, and they play the Chicago Cubs in 1945. He's facing major league talent, and he goes one for three in that game and plays major league caliber ball. So just really wanted to point that out, that these were great ball players who just didn't get that opportunity. The stars didn't align. So that could go. Yeah. But with that, um, oh, did we want to, do you want to transition here going into the modern day celebration? Well, yeah, we have these modern day uh, uh, legacy players, again, like Kurt Suzuki, uh, Travis Ishikawa, um, Kristen Yelich, who became an MVP award winner. Um, and then these were Japanese Americans on the left side of the screen. And then, of course, Ichiro Suzuki, who in 2025, uh, well, I'm sure will be a first ballot enshrinement. Uh, and so hopefully he'll be our, our Ted Williams. Uh, Ted Williams, when he was inducted, he mentioned uh, in his induction speech that he hoped that the Negro League players and the Black All-Stars would be recognized someday with the museum. And, and hopefully Ichiro, uh, uh, once he gets in, uh, you know, also our Japanese Americans, which, you know, to, as I mentioned before, would be his godfathers. And um, he would be standing on the shoulders of these e early Issei and Issei tours that went to Japan, Korea, Manchukuo, China. And we have so many other players. I mean, uh, uh, with the Yankees, Kyle Higashioka, Isaiah Kiner Falefa, uh, Davy Roberts. Uh, you know his mother is Japanese and uh, his dad is black. Uh, he's a, uh, a hapa, you know, half. Or um, we have Steve Kwan, you know, who's tearing it up with the Guardians. Uh, so whether you're, I think all the Asian Pacific players, you know, they uh, these early Issei and Issei are their godfathers and. Uh, so hopefully uh, they will get a little sense of the history at some point. I know Don has um, mentored and so many of the Major League Baseball players and, and shared our history. So we're very appreciative that hopefully the word's getting out and they're appreciative of, of the roots uh, of the game. Okay. Thank you. All right. Good transition. Let's move into... Uh... I guess, modern day accomplishments and celebrations. And Don, we're gonna hand it off to you. Hope you don't mind, but we've thrown in a few slides uh, as a surprise to celebrate your contributions to the game. And I also put, to get, put together a little uh, career montage of uh, some of the places you've been and the teams you've uh, impacted in your role in the game. So, hey, congratulations on a, a wonderful long career in the game. And if you could, uh, can you, we start from the beginning and just tell us about uh, your passions, your inspirations, where you got started and some of your great influences along the way, uh, great highlights and maybe even lessons learned. Because for me, baseball is not just about success, but uh, failures and opportunities to learn and help other people grow. And so if you could just uh, let's hear some baseball, some wonderful stories. Well, there's some old pictures there. I see that number one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it didn't flash by in a second, but, uh, uh, you know, it was quite a journey. You know, I was really fortunate to, to meet a lot of people in my career and go a lot of places. Um, you know, I think early in my career, like I mentioned before, just being able to see guys like Lenny Sakata or, you know, I had Mike Lum uh, in the Chicago White Sox organization as a, as a hitting instructor, um, you know, to be able to follow Sadahara O in his career and actually get an opportunity to meet him on several different occasions and talk baseball. 
Um, to be able to go to Japan on several different occasions. I went and trained with the Hiroshima Carps as a guest instructor down in Okinawa. Uh, back in 2008, I was a bench coach for the Oakland A's and was fortunate to go over and open against the Boston Red Sox uh, series in the Tokyo Dome and take my family over there. Um, and my two boys at that time took batting practice in the Tokyo Dome. And now my son, Luke, is, is playing uh, in Japan, uh, in Nagoya for the Chunichi Dragons. And so it's, wow. it's, it's, uh, it's kind of ironic in some ways that I've been there so many times. My son's playing there, but yet my grandparents had never been there, you know, and been interned in the camps. My father was born in the camps. So it was, uh, you know, I, I look at today's um, uh, event with the opportunity to, to continue to educate because I didn't know anything about it um, uh, of the internment until I was probably 16 years old. They just never spoke about it. And people know that so much about the history of the Japanese that came out, out of the camps and were so proud. Um, but, it's, you know, going back to baseball, I was fortunate to play a lot of baseball in my youth. I played uh, the JCL youth, which I still to this day give credit to where I ended up in my career because it allowed me not only to play um, little league baseball, but JCL at the same time and develop maybe a little bit faster, you know, different competition and um, was fortunate to get a, a college scholarship at Arizona state and went to the college world series two different times there. And, and, uh, you know, I, I think about youth sports and, and why guys are able to um, continue on is because they have to be in successful programs. They have to be around good players. And I was, I was one of those. Uh, I played on a, a summer league team in the San Francisco Bay area called Bergovich. It was sponsored by uh, Sam Bergovich who owned a furniture company. Uh, and that team alone, I think had 12 major league players, Randy Johnson on it. Um, mm -hmm the Moss brothers, uh, you know, uh, even before me, Chris Spire and Joe Morgan. So it was a legendary program. So I was just fortunate to be, um, to, to, like I said, to watch young players uh, or players like Lenny Cicada and Natalie Hammerker, I believe was half, um, you know, some of those players, which we had very few. And so when I look at my platform throughout my career, I try to do the best I can to educate people and be a role model for the young, those young players. Um, after Arizona State, I was drafted by the Cincinnati Reds and went on to, to be kind of the Crash Davis uh, of minor league baseball, which um, I kind of found my calling there because I'd, I'd been in the minor leagues for so long. When younger players came through there, I started mentoring them, which led into kind of a natural progression into coaching and started my pro uh, coaching career with the Arizona Diamondbacks before they even had a major league team. Mm -hmm. And um, I just kind of knew that the, I think it's when we call it goosebumps, you know, when you're coaching and a player does well and you get goosebumps, um, you kind of know that that's in your blood. And I ended up going coaching uh, very few years in the minor leagues, but quite a few in the major leagues. And, and um, as Kerry had mentioned, you know, uh, Isaiah kind of Falafa, Kurt Suzuki, um, you know, Kyle Higashioka, all these players, um, it's the six degrees of separation. You know, I was fortunate to, to be a part of, of their development and, and to this day, um, you know, have a relationship with Ichiro. Uh, these are guys that, um, you know, you kind of gravitate towards because you, you want them to be just that much more successful. So there's more uh, Asian Americans in baseball and people, as, uh, as Bill had mentioned, uh, at some point, you know, people don't realize how, how small that minority truly is. If you took out um, the Japanese, the true Japanese players from Japan, how small a number that really is with the Kurt Suzuki's and those kind of guys. Um, so it, it's always, it was always a, a great pleasure. And I still talk to Kurt to this day, you know, watching him win a World Series was, was an emotional part uh, uh, mm -hmm. for me. But um you know, I spent a, a lot of time traveling around different teams and building relationships and then uh, finally got the opportunity to manage uh, in Seattle. And it's funny, starting out, uh, I never set out to be a major league manager. I set out to to have an impact on players' lives. And, uh, you know, I had a cup of coffee in the big leagues, and, and that was something that I felt like every player that got into professional baseball, that was a personal goal to be able to get them to the big leagues so they can experience what I did. Uh, and it was an amazing, it's an amazing thing to, to start at eight years old and go through every single level there is and play at the highest level, whether it's for a day or whether it's for, you know, 20 years. 
um, you know, it's quite an accomplishment if you look at how many people play. And so uh, to travel the world, to, to go to Nicaragua, to go to Venezuela, to go to uh, the Dominican Republic, to play bas baseball in Alaska, it's afforded me a lot of luxuries in my life and a lot of experience. And, and more importantly, like I said, the relationships. And they say, you know, as a, as a coach, um, how do you know if you're a good coach? They say by the amount of Christmas cards you get. So I think it's emails now. So it has changed. Um, but the game's changed a lot, you know, over the last, uh, especially in the last, you know, 10 years, I would say, with, uh, with uh, the Moneyball era and, uh, and Sabre metrics. And so it's, it's changed a lot. Um, some good, some bad. I think you talk about instant replay was never around when I started, you know, and that was one of my, uh, at some point I said, I think it was the highest paid uh, phone answer in baseball and instant replay. So it was a, uh, you know, um, the sure, game sure. is still, I think today there's some exciting young players and, and uh, it's a great time. I think Major League Baseball is clamoring. Um, I think what we were talking about is, is being able to include, including Asian Americans. And it's something MLB has a, an obligation to do. And I think it'll help the game in general. Nice. Hey, Don, can you speak to uh, maybe your greatest managing influence? Who did you model your maybe style after? Or who, who influenced you? Just curious. Well, yeah, that's a great question. I, you know, I talk a lot about um, managerial styles and, and in, in a lot of ways you don't realize you're going through it, but you're kind of groomed because being with seven minor league teams. And I think at that point I'd already been with, with uh, Texas Rangers, Oakland A's, and then, and then the Seattle Mariners and uh, being under Buck Showalter, uh, being mm -hmm. under Jeff Torborg, um, Buddy Black, Joe Madden, um, Bobby Guerin, uh, Johnny Farrell. So I, I had the opportunity to, to be around a lot of brilliant minds in the game and um, a lot of different styles, both in handling the media, handling the players, um, st uh, strategy, um, you know, and I was fortunate. It, it was, uh, people don't realize it, but uh, about a year before I got hired in Seattle, I was I was up there with the Oakland A's playing the Seattle Mariners, and I said, you know what, I'm going to manage here next year. And it's one of those things, if you have passion and you have a vision, it comes true, and I was fortunate. It didn't last as long as I wanted. Maybe that was a failure in some ways, uh, but you know, you look at those sometimes and I was fortunate to, to turn right around and win a world series with the Kansas city Royals, which was, uh, you know, the highlight of my coaching career to be able to stand in, uh, in New York against the New York Mets and, and, and call yourself a world champion. And, um, truly as a, as a, as a major league coach, uh, we, I won one with the Anaheim angels where I, I did, uh, the development for all the minor leagues, but to actually stand on that field, but to watch those guys develop through 162 games, um, you know, we played close to 440 games in two years when you count spring training and playoff games, regular season. So uh, it, it was a grind and one that, um, you know, you just cherish for the rest of your life. Great. Carrie or Brandon, do you guys have a question? Uh, I do have a few more. I don't want to hog the table here. Uh, if not, I'll keep it. No, not much of a question. I mean, some of it is just uh, kind of just knowing little bits here and there uh, about Don and his journey and what he's been able to accomplish. Uh, you know, the I think the funny thing that comes up is as uh, Don was so gracious to write the forward to uh, to Bill's book, um, you know, flipping through the pages, the first I think it was maybe the first or second time that I got a chance to go through the book, um, the picture of uh I can't even remember what page, but uh, there's a picture of uh, grandpa, um, my grandfather, not great grandpa, but uh, grandpa coaching uh, with, and it's funny that Fernie Garcia is right next to him. Fernie still runs the team now, um, but Don's, Don's in that picture. Yeah. Uh, and it was, uh, it, it was pretty funny that I asked grandma about it and grandma said, oh yeah, I think he went to Japan. I think he went yeah. to Japan. Six, six degrees of separation. It's amazing. You know, and that was just a kind of a fluke. Uh, I was, uh, I decided I was at Arizona state and decided not to play um, summer ball um, hmm. that year and, and end up going to Japan and had a great time and uh, got to see festivals of Bono Dodi and some of the Japanese festivals over there. And, and uh, to this day, there's some, some players on that team that still reach out to me. Yeah. That's great. Hey, Don, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Carrie, did you have a question? I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. 
Oh, can you speak to the experience and maybe similarities and differences with uh, Nikkei players and Japanese nationals, given that you coached Ichiro and some of those conversations? Yeah, I, I think number one's got to be the culture. You know, I, I think about my experiences going to different different countries and playing and how difficult it was, whether it was food or lifestyle or just um, the style of baseball. You know, Ichiro um, and I became really close friends when I managed up there, which to this day we still keep in touch. And, and um, you know, his, his work ethic um, – you know, he and he's a modern day samurai in some ways of baseball. He literally some of the stories uh, that I could tell you on his his work ethic. Uh, if you think about 162 games, he never took a day off. And, we, you know, we have 20 games off or 20 days off in a season or so. But when we traveled, if we got in on time, he would either um, flip the mattress up in his hotel room and take batting practice in his flip, flips in his room or he'd have his translator go over to the stadium and they'd actually work out and um, I'll tell you a quick story that uh, on my on my managerial career uh, Ichiro just came back from the WBC and uh, he looked really uh, really thin and so we sent him to the doctors and they they said he had a uh, an ulcer um, and he was losing weight so we had to put him on the DL but that he had never been on the DL in 10 years um, and it was a lot of pride factor and he didn't want to go on. And we're in a meeting upstairs with about six uh, front office people from the Seattle Mariners, including the doctor. And the doctor had spoke to him in front of all of us and said, listen, you know, if you if you play, you have a chance to rupture that on a field and you could die. And he sat there for four or five minutes in silence with the whole room and finally says, well, I'll take that chance. You know, and here I am thinking, this guy's willing to die for that game. And so I said, you know, do you mind if I take you downstairs and talk to you a little bit? So I took him downstairs and I said, listen, you know, I've never respected a player more than, than you in the history of the game, but you will not die on me <laughs> my first year managing the big leagues. And so he kind of <laughs> laughed and he agreed. But uh, and we put his jersey, we hung his jersey up for the first time in, a, in the dugout everywhere we went for the first time he was ever on the deal. And I think that built that bond with us. So um, each real is a very funny player uh, that you look at the pitcher down here. Uh, you know, he's, he's got a great sense of humor. And then we were together over with the New York Yankees. And so, um, you know, he's uh, uh, some kind of uh, an athlete, but it didn't come without work. He took, they said in high school, he took literally a thousand swings a day. So when you talk to young players today, when they go out and they hit a bucket of balls, it's like, you have no idea. <laughs> sure. Hey, one final question uh, before we move on to the next topic. I think we have time. Uh, can you speak to, um, as, a, as a manager and a coach, you're teaching people how to play the game, but also with your role um, as a role model, uh, Japanese American, teaching the younger players about their history, giving examples where you maybe took a player aside and told them some, some stories about your family history or the larger legacy? Well, I, I think it goes back to, you know, Kurt Suzuki's probably, you know, one of my closest friends in the game. And um, and, and Kurt's one that I think when they're young, um, just like I was as a young manager, you know, you're worried about the game, but the, there's a bigger, much bigger platform that you can accomplish at the same time. And it's, you know, the lesson in sports in general, it, it's the more that you get away from your own internal ego, the better player you become. Um, and so we talk a lot about giving back and, and, and being that role model or being that, um, that beacon for a young player and take every opportunity you have to be able to go speak to be able to to do an interview and, and I've probably done more in the last 10 years than I ever did earlier because you start to realize that you know your career's short and long in, in, in some ways um, and that that opportunity to um, to change somebody's life uh, similar to the Sada Hadaro ball signing that you talked about and so you know that was something whether it's uh, you know Kyle Higashioka was a double A player in the Yankee organization when we first uh, when I, we were first inter introduced you know and Isaiah kind of falafa from Hawaii you know was a young fiery player that um, all he cared about was playing for himself and and he's become a uh, one heck of a, um, a mentor or or a, a leader on the club and and um, 
you know, now he's, he's almost in his fifth year in, in the big leagues now. And so w- those are things that we talk about. And don't forget your past. Don't forget to be able to contribute to the youth of today. Hey, Bill, can I say something real quick to Don? Uh, Please do. We yep. honored uh, Nisei Pioneers, uh, and uh, this was with the uh, in Sacramento. And so I asked Don if he could share with him when he was with the Oakland A's, uh, you know, something encouraging to um, – as a uh, legacy player to these pioneers in their 90s. And Don shared, uh, which we shared on the Jumbotron, um, that his grandparents, when they left Tule Lake after World War II, they actually purchased some of the barracks and the wood and built it onto their home uh, and ranch at, in Oregon. And so uh, Don, as a kid, never really knew that till mm-hmm. he one day asked his grandparents about this edition and it, it really impacted him and so i just thought i i'd ask don to share that story too uh, of how it impacted him knowing that his grandparents even brought some of the barracks back home to their ranch well it, it's funny i live you know i'm, I'm uh, we'll get to it a little bit later but uh, i'm working on a, a non-profit educational farm here in hood river oregon and at the time there was um uh 16 soldiers, I believe it's 16 soldiers that were blackballed from um, coming back um, from the war. They were blacklisted and and not honored. And, um, you know, you don't realize the impact of that when you're growing up. And and I remember sitting in the living room one time talking about that experience of being interned in the camp with my grandparents. And, and my grandmother said, this, this house that you're in right now was built with some of the wood that we, we had uh, um, from the barracks. And, and you start realizing that, you know, the, the material possessions that they lost um, and, and the state of when they came back of what they had to do to survive um, and, and provide for us. And, and it just, it was very emotional for me to be able to think that in some ways that you would even consider that, but you, you, you kind of put it in, in, um, in perspective that what they had to do at the time to be able to, to move on and, and grow. And, and it was, it was extremely emotional to me. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Uh, so next, we'll move on to the final chapter, if you will, of the, uh, the presentation. We're going to talk about uh, advocating, uh, creating opportunities for more diversity, equity, inclusion for Asian Americans in baseball. Uh, Don, I, I do want you to contribute quite a bit just because of your experience and your insight. But I was going to ask Brandon to lead it off. Um, I'm really uh, appreciate his role as being the uh, younger member of the, uh, the panel, uh, also a GOSE and an educator. I think you have your finger on the pulse of the younger generation. Uh, so if you could, uh, what gives you hope and where do you see opportunities uh, in the future here? Well, uh, with the amount of press uh, that's been kind of per, uh, published recently, which is kind of nice, uh, I think in, in, some, in some regard, it, it's, it's the idea of the story. You know, it's how the story is shared, how the story is told and how the continuation of um, you know, as a Japanese, uh, as a big time Japanese player comes, a uh, Japanese national player comes from Japan and enters the MLB and they kind of make a big splash. Uh, at some particular point, I always felt, okay, well, Otani's coming. Awesome. At some point, somebody's going to bring up great grandpa. Uh, and and that, that kind of pattern um, has been a little bit, uh, maybe accelerated a bit. Um, there's also been the idea that as uh, as those players have come, the I felt like the articles have gotten a little longer and longer. And there's been more detail and more, and I think some of that is due to uh, the work. You know, Bill, you've done such a great job, kind of curating all of these, all of these artifacts, all of these uh, statistics, all of these dates, all of these events, um, and you have been able to, um, you've been able to fill the gap, um, fill the gap with a story, with a game, with. Uh, where somebody might have been at some particular time and, and drawing the correlation between those events and those ideas. So I, I, I truly appreciate that. Uh, I know that uh, my family, as we, as I share information that you share with me, uh, they all appreciate it and think, man, where is he finding all this stuff? Um, 
And so uh, we just want to say thank you for. Uh, well, we can also thank technology for that as well. Just the fact that more things are becoming digitized. We live in the information age. And that's what's really exciting about this story being told and shared and, and really getting the attention that it needs. So uh, it's, yeah, good timing too in terms of technology. But Kerry Nakagawa had the great uh, honor of interviewing most of these ball players. So there's something to be said about that as well uh, in terms of where you were in your place and time, Kerry, and that, that great opportunity to meet all those ball players and capture those stories. So. Thank you, Bill. Well, I, I feel it's been an anointment, you know, uh, epiphany, uh, a confluence of events, as the poet Charlie Vassalero, baseball historian, would say. Uh, but yeah, you, Bill, uh, I'll never forget one of your quotes, you know, Blacks integrated baseball, uh, Japanese Americans internationalized it. Uh, you know, different uh, dynamic, uh, uh, similar struggle, uh, but equally important. And your wizardry, uh, not only with baseball history and statistics and, and the stories, uh, you know, inspire us all. And uh, so we just hope you keep doing what you do. And, you know, having a wife, uh, Kyra, whose uncles played in the Negro Leagues and being such an uh, in-depth historian on Japanese American baseball. Uh, I think we're all part, I think Coincidence is too vague. I think I think uh, when the right people, places, and things line up, it's always for the right reasons. And uh, so all of us involved were part of this tapestry to, to tell the story and to further honor these, these pioneers and American ambassadors. So I just feel a, a great uh, satisfaction of being part of this huge tapestry of, of players and history and uh, whether they be the ones that went before us or legacy players of today. Uh, it's been uh, an amazing journey. Uh, as I always say, I'm far, far and away from the richest, but um, to have a God Papa like Pat Morita, to have an uncle like Buck O'Neill, I feel like I'm one of the, the wealthiest people on the earth, uh, places I've traveled to, uh, much like Don has, and now his son Luke will experience it in Japan. And so uh, I think we all, uh, as long as we have our health, we're all billionaires and we get to share these stories and keep passing them on. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I do feel for me as a historian and preserving a story, it's not about selling books. It's about gaining uh, recognition and respect and then creating opportunity. So, uh, and with that, before we all met, I had shared uh, with you, Brandon and others, a list of uh, kind of a reflection on the past 15 years, if you will, with the NBRP and the JECL. Some of the uh, requests and asks that we've had with either the Hall of Fame or Major League Baseball. Uh, some of them are fairly mainstream. Uh, it's the, the equivalent of what they've done for recognizing the Negro League history. Uh, but others are maybe a little bit more controversial. And I didn't know if we wanted to, because JECL is a civil rights organization. It's about social justice. Uh, and so I, can we talk a little bit about that, uh, creating opportunities uh, to celebrate the history, but even players for today and, and the youth of today. So for example, uh, the uh, Asian American population in the US is 7%, but only 2% is uh, represented in Major League Baseball. But we don't hear much about that disparity and that gap. Uh, so there's an opportunity there. And maybe Don, if you wanna jump in in terms of what you've seen in terms of coaching and youth training and that type of thing. Well, I'll go back to, uh, you know, when Carrie and I's involvement, um, Carrie had borrowed a, I was fortunate to acquire a kimono. Um, and I can't remember the year now, I think it's 1913 or something. You probably know Carrie. Um, so I found a, a there was an old what we call a bird dog scout that was living in Phoenix, Arizona, and he had a little ad in the paper and had old baseball stuff. And I walked in there and he had a bunch of just ordinary stuff. But in the back of this old closet, he had a, a kimono that had all this baseball paraphernalia kind of printed on it or sewn into it. And it was a it was a gift to a third baseman named C.L. Brignall. And I end up downloading that picture um, from Chicago University. Um, I think it was a gift from a Japanese university to a, a Chicago university that was traveling and playing in Japan. 
Uh, well, Kerry had put together a, a tremendous uh, exhibit to go to the Hall of Fame. And I think those are things um, that are all tied into timing. You know, if, if that's done today, maybe we get, you know, if we have a second go around to be able to do that. And um, I think the West Coast in general does a pretty good job because of the Asian community, the Dodgers, um, the Oakland A's, uh, Seattle to a point. You know, all the West Coast teams do a pretty good job of having a, an honorary Asian night um, and, and, and history. And I think, um, you know, I think as of recently, I think it's it, the, the timing's better and better. Um, but there's a lot, of, a lot of work to be done still. Yeah. Yeah, with that, uh, there have been uh, the Oakland A's uh, out here in spring training in Arizona back in 2013. They were kind enough to celebrate the 70th anniversary of Zenimir Field at Gila River. Uh, so the Oakland A's and teams like that have really stepped up. Uh, we're still looking uh, for opportunities to have some throwback games uh, with the jerseys like they do with the Neither League teams. Um, let's see, I think it was 2015-16, uh, Major League Baseball had an honorary draft for uh, the Negro Leaguers who were still around, and, and we had asked for that. And, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the, uh, the Nisei pioneers have passed since then, but that would have been a, a really nice opportunity um, to do that. Um, I think, you know, one, one of the okay. things, Bill, I think is you look at um, the popular players today, the, the Asian players, and, and they hold the power, right? And to be able to kind of demand a little bit more, whether it's Kurt Suzuki or whether it's Isaiah or Stephen Kwan or, or some of these guys um, right now in their cities so to be able to kind of move it more. And, uh, you know, yeah. Isaiah's in New York and, and Stephen's in, in uh, Cleveland, uh, you know, those kind of places where we can, you know, ask those guys maybe to do a little bit more. And I think that'll help because they, they do hold the power. Okay. Uh, Bill, I want to quickly inject too that the yeah. uh, next year, 2023, I've already put in a letter to a commissioner, M a Manfred at Major League Baseball, uh, Larry Bear with the San Francisco Giants. The 1903 Fuji Athletic Club, an Issei team, is going to be celebrating 120 years. Uh, so it would be amazing to have the San Francisco Giants take the field in honor of these Issei players and the 1903 jerseys and maybe the visitors wear the, uh, the 1924 San Jose Asahi uniforms or the uh, 1937 Alameda Kono All-Stars uniform. Uh, you know, we've uh, been granted uh, uh, for the 2002 uh, July 19th uh, All-Star game, we're gonna have a little exhibit at Dodger Stadium. Uh, so, uh, right next to the Negro Leagues exhibit. That's uh, a fantastically uh, well-funded traveling exhibit. So we'll put uh, a, in a 20 by uh, 17 area, at least we'll get a, a small voice of our Japanese American baseball history. And hopefully this will lead to uh, more education, advocacy, and um, inspiration to make our exhibit even bigger to travel to more major league stadiums. Uh, like John had mentioned, you know, particularly the West Coast, because that's where the states were impacted the most uh, during the executive order in 9066, 80 yep. years ago. Uh, so uh, we'll just keep pounding and, and keep crusading and lobbying. And uh, the more education, the more advocacy we do, uh, the more hopefully uh, it'll get attention and, and catch the ears eventually. Uh, at the National Baseball Hall of Fame, there's permanent exhibits on the All-American Girls story, the pride and the passion of the Black All-Stars, the Latinos in baseball. So uh, we're very much uh, crusading to get our Asian American ball players that were our American ambassadors, you know, as I mentioned, as early as 1914 to get recognized. So hopefully uh, with Ichiro's induction in, in 2025, uh, he'll advocate uh, for his godfathers and um, also baseball during World War II, we should be able to get on the timeline where uh, these baseball players kept uh, the All-American pastime alive, even from behind Bob Wire. Uh, no other race could make that statement. So we're hopeful to, to get on the timeline that way as well. 
I anticipated you might say that, had the visual all queued up. There we go. <laughs> As always. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, if I could, I just want to touch on a few other things. Um, we had talked about the West Coast uh, representation. Uh, a while ago, we had advocated for a civil rights game for Major League Baseball, uh, tied in with Executive Order 9066. I think that would be really powerful on the West Coast. So that's an opportunity that's out there. Then the other one is uh, totally reimagining how Major League Baseball approaches its uh, historical uh, leadership. Right now, it's one individual as the official historian. We think there's an opportunity to create a more diverse panel of historians and have uh, each uh, what I would call historically marginalized uh, baseball uh, institution represented at the table, having a voice and really having more representation. So those are some of the conversations we're having. Uh, and then the final thing I'd like to add, uh, we, we touched on the Hall of Fame here. Um, the Hall of Fame does have an opportunity to recognize this legacy that we were discussing here. Uh, however, the rules are structured in a way where they're only uh, considering uh, Major League Baseball players and Negro League players. There's really no opportunity for anybody who wasn't in those two institutions. So we are advocating now to get those rules changed to, again to recognize or have the opportunity to nominate individuals who played in any of the historically marginalized leagues, uh, not just Japanese Americans, but all the other Asian American leagues and even women in baseball. There's probably some great stories there that uh, still need to be told. So just wanted to share that. Uh, how are we doing on time? I think we're at 10 after, is that right? And I know yeah. we wanted to open it up to uh, Q&A for the audience. By the way, Brandon has mentioned a few times his uh, grandfather, and I actually included him here. Uh, for those who may visit Arizona at some point in the future, we have a park that we've constructed called Nozomi Park. Nozomi is the Japanese word for hope, and it was uh, created to honor uh, the game of baseball and the role it played, uh, well, really to honor the 30,000 Japanese Americans who are incarcerated in Arizona, but how they turned to the game of baseball that gave them a sense of hope. There's only one other Nozomi Park in the world, and it's in Nagasaki, Japan. Uh, but this is uh, Howard Kinso Zenimura pointing to himself at age 15 uh, on the kiosk that we have out at the park. So, and it's uh, probably a quarter of a mile away from the border of Gila River. So it's the closest we could get to uh, celebrating and recognizing that history without actually being on the land. Uh, it's, own, it's sovereign land owned by the Gila River Indian community. And they're uh, very protective of who goes out there. And they really do a, a wonderful job protecting that historic site. All right. So with that, uh, why don't we open it up to the Q&A? And if not, uh, we can ask questions amongst one another, but I'm sure we have lots of questions. Uh, I'm not seeing the Q&A, so if maybe the other moderators could help us. Um, I could see the Q&A, so I can go and present them. Yeah. Um, so this one comes from Colin Hansen. Um, he said, Carrie is talking about education of this topic. There are many books about it for schools to read for, to students, barbed wire, baseball, baseball saved us, a diamond in the, the desert, et cetera. But is there a push to have this put into textbooks and curriculum standards throughout the US? Is someone working with state curriculum, DPI people to get this into schools, textbook companies? Thank you. Oh, thank you, Colin. I, I know just speaking from Art, myself, uh, we were able to work with uh, and co-produce uh, with SPICE, the Stanford Program of International Cross-Culture Education and Dr. Gary Mukai at Stanford University to develop two curriculum, um, one on the incarceration and one specifically for our film that we produce called American Pastime. So I know that SPICE, uh, they are the, uh, uh, they primarily work with democracy, but uh, they've written curriculum for um, Yo-Yo Ma's uh, Spice uh, Road uh, uh, tour. And so we're working with as many, um, and we know teachers, you know, there isn't much funding for them. Uh, so we offer these two curriculum for free 
uh, we'd like to expand that, you know, we're working with Spice and Stanford to, to get to our curriculum out to uh, end books to as many other, you know, uh, uh, high schools, junior highs, uh, whatever applies. But uh, I know Colin Hansen with uh, uh, his program in Wisconsin, uh, you know, a walk in their shoes, amazing, where he brings in uh, just all these storytellers, uh, Kenzo Zenimura, myself, Ted Furukawa, we are able to share with 1,700 high school students and with just one high school, uh, the story of baseball behind Bob Wire. Uh, he's brought in so many other, uh, you know, the uh, um, so many, just so many amazing celebrities. Uh, I, I told him that he should write a book in himself. Uh, so, because there's very little, obviously, diversity in Wausau, Wisconsin, but uh, he'll bring in uh, these diverse stories. So um, with Colin, and his, his advocacy and others, uh, I'm sure we can make a, a great push for more curriculum, more books uh, to be widely distributed and, and, uh, and viewed. You know, to kind of speak to that as well, you know, being in education and um, for the past, this is this is year 12 for me as a teacher. Um, but knowing that within the valley, within the Central Valley, I know that uh, many of the high schools and districts uh, around have honored those uh, those that would have graduated in 1941, 1942, 1943. So the school that I used to work at, Sanger High School, there is a plaque and there are a couple of trees that are committed and dedicated to those that graduated. Uh, every year during uh, World War II, I mean, within the world history textbook, the blip of Japanese internment is maybe about a paragraph long. Um, but due to the fact that the relationships that I had with the history teachers, um, it was always that I would have kids come into class. Uh, I had grandpa's picture up on, on my wall, but kids would come into class and, and say, Hey, uh, you know, Miss Mello, Hey, Mr. Platt said to come in and ask you about Japanese internment in your great grandpa. And so I would get a chance to share there. So I know that in some ways we've, we've made, we've made traction here in the Valley, because I think there are enough, as Don said, on the West coast, there's enough awareness. Um, and I mean, to, to suggest that there, there's, there's more opportunities as, you know, Colin Hansen says that there's, there's other books to read. Um, many of the students that I have when they hit, when they got to me in high school, 10th grade, 11th grade, uh, they knew, they knew baseball saved us. At some particular point, somebody had read that to them, or it's been part of their classroom library. Um, with uh, the there was a summer school class just this past year in Sanger Unified, fifth grade, they read barbed wire baseball as their summer assignment. Um, and I got a, I got a picture and a curriculum, a curriculum, um, a curriculum specialist from the district had sent me the picture saying, "Look at where what our fifth graders are going to be reading for for the summer." Um, so I know that there is some awareness. However, the traction to make it uh, a grand, it, take it to a grander scale, I, I, I do feel like that's where uh, that's where we're falling short, and that's not uh, it's not what we're seeing. You know, it's uh, the story itself isn't being shared to a big enough audience, and I think some of the recognition that we're talking about that that Bill's trying to address with the National Baseball Hall of Fame and with Major League Baseball to do a little bit more. Um, something that Fresno State did recently uh, in the last, I think that was five years ago, they actually did a throwback jersey year where they had these Nike jerseys that were made uh, that were to emulate the Fresno Athletic Club. Um, so we all went to the game to check it out. And uh, my oh my, were those cool. Um, but Fresno State had an opportunity to do that. And Fresno State being the place where grandpa played, where uh, Uncle Kenshi played, uh, where Fibber Hirayama played. Um, so guys that uh, definitely were trailblazers in that sense, got out of camp because of the amount of time they spent on the baseball field, because of the amount of grind, I guess you could say. Um, well, grandpa would say that. He would talk about, ah, uh, we play so much baseball. We're out in the field all the time. Um, but from the amount of time that he played, it, it really did in some ways propel him forward to be able to be that trailblazer for me, for us, for, um, for all of the younger Yonsei, Gosei, um, that, that did go on to play, that, that played the little league, played in junior high, played the Babe Ruth leagues, played high school, played on in college, and then 
did some amazing things to go on beyond the game like Don did. Um, so I just, I appreciate it. I appreciate it, but feel like, yeah, the story, story needs some recognition. And in that, uh, that's where we're going to gain the, you know, the, the bigger recognition. I think that Don's uh, that, uh, Bill and Carrie are trying to accomplish. If I could add to that, uh, Don, I was really uh, interested to hear about your influence as a young person playing for JCL sponsored teams. And uh, here in Arizona, we're looking to maybe do that again, have the JCL be more involved in youth sports. And because uh, I think that's an, another important way to make a positive impact. Because kids, you only have uh, a short attention span in the classroom and they tune out. So if you can impact them in other ways, uh, we're definitely you know, looking at things like that as well. Well, I, would, I, I think also, you know, again, it's the experiences they have. And I was fortunate to have really good experience, really good coaches at, at that, that youth age. And I think uh, setting up a system that, that, that um, has good coaches in it um, and the fact that they might not be able to play on other teams, right? It gives them an opportunity to play at a young age and continue to develop and, and maybe go on. And I think, you know, you can't underscore the the importance of a player like Otani right now, right? You know, um, but, <laughs> you know, he's an anomaly in itself because he's six foot five, right? He's a big man. He's strong. He's fast. He does it all. He's one of the greatest players that ever put on a uniform physically, you know, um, right now for 100 miles an hour. So those are kind of things that um, have really been a shining star for, um, you know, Japanese youth in, in, in the U.S. It's you know, they, they talk about Michael Jordan's um, influence on, on uh, you know, black youth playing base, uh, basketball, right? And let's, let's hope and continue to push that with Otani, you know? Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Do we have another question in the Q&A? Yes, we actually have, we're just cautious of time too. So, yeah. but I think we'll cap, we'll try to capture everybody's questions um, no matter yeah. what with the end time, but um, kind of piggybacking off of that first question, um, for those of us new to Japanese American baseball history and baseball history in general, how would you recommend beginning to learn? You say baseball.com. <laughs> Good start. Yeah, I, I think go, go watch Kerry's movie. You know, John Crock, you know, <laughs> yeah, those are things to start, you know, to be able to see those kind of things. And, um, you know, just just as I did, you know, to be able to educate yourself. And, and again, I think through the media, through through uh, the Internet, there's so much available out there. There's so many articles, um, you know, that you can kind of educate yourself on it now. Thank you, Saki. I think, you know, you're going to post, uh, you know, our website. I don't want to be too. You know, shame, shame the lugs, but Don has a, a nonprofit, and I think his uh, walkway will be posted. Bill has an amazing blog. We have our Nisei Baseball uh, on Facebook. We're at Nisei Baseball Research Project. Brandon has, you know, his uh, blog site. So, uh, you know, you can start there, and there's so many books now that are out there, like Colin Hansen mentioned. Uh, you know, we have a documentary, Diamonds in the Rough, I did with our God Papa Pat Morita, our uh, award-winning film, American Pastime, which uh, didn't get a lot of uh, viewer audience and we're still promoting it uh, 15 years later, but uh, just reach out uh, onto the internet. There's like Bill did, you could just Google many of the uh, uh, answers uh, and go to those sites. Okay, great. Um, the next question is, and more about sort of like the youth element here are this, and this question comes from Del Spurlock. Are the successes of Japanese little leagues um, in the little league world series within the purview of your story? Don, I think I'm gonna pass that one to you. How impactful was the little league uh, League, little leaguers from Japan are impacting yeah. baseball today. Yeah, I don't, you know, I think there's two different subjects, right? Um, you know, when you're talking about Japanese American baseball, to me, I look at it from, you know, the, the, the Kurt Suzuki stories, you know, um, players that either came from the, the mainland or, or from Hawaii or, or um, in the Japanese little leagues, a little bit different. 
uh, players that come from Japan, like Ichiro or Matsui or Tanaka, uh, these type of players that come over and and um, and play and prove themselves on a different stage. That that's in the, that's in the same category for me, you know. But um, you know, I read one of the questions about um, you know did did the pioneers playing baseball in camp influence some of the the way the Japanese American players play today? I think absolutely. You know, some of the players that I've had are, are just uh, Isaiah kind of falafel, you know, should have been born, you know, and played in the camps. And that's kind of a scrappy player he is because he's not a very big guy, um, but but he's such a competitor. And I think that a lot of that still uh, resonates in, in some of the Japanese American players today. I think they, they have to fight, uh, you know, the gun body they got. They, they got to give it. They're all because of the stature. Still, you're starting to see, you know, um, Ishikawa, I think, from the Giants was was a, a, a bigger player. Uh, you're starting to see some size in some of the younger players, but um, nothing nothing influences it more like a, a player like Otani. Okay, and I also think. Sorry, I just want. Oh, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, there, there are some of the Tokyo University teams that do come and they do a they do a tour of the West Coast. You know, they get a chance to play uh, University of Hawaii, then they come to the mainlands and they and, and really they kind of go down California. Uh, while I was playing at Sonoma State, um, we got a chance to play play a, a doubleheader against Cale University. And just the fellowship in in that whole process, uh, the the after game camaraderie that we had, the the opportunity to, and in, in some ways I laughed. I, being the whole 105, 8, 5, 9, 175 pounds, uh, looking at some of these Japanese guys that came over from Keio University that are like six foot and 220 pounds. Uh, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't believe uh, the difference in, hey, the heck did you eat? Um, but the idea of how baseball is, is a great opportunity to to create those bonds, to to have those opportunities to talk and 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 and, and really speak baseball because that's all it was it was baseball and in uh, major university comes to arizona or used to quite a bit and so uh, i went and presented to them somebody translated but they all left with a baseball card of your great grandfather <laughs> pretty exciting yeah i think you know uh, randy you talked about going to japan being in osaka you know my both my kids uh, went on international tours as far as uh, at, at youth to to went, went to Japan, I think culturally, and um, it's so important to be able to send kids from the United States over there, um, Japanese American player, uh, players to go over there and play, uh, maybe more so than the other way around. Yeah, great. Um, kind of tying into what we were just talking about more of like the cross-cultural connections is, um, this question comes from Randall Fujimoto. Is there a connection between Japanese American baseball history and traditional Japanese American cultural values such as gaman, gambare, and shikata ganai? So we kind of just spoke about it, but I don't know if there's anything else that you all want to mention or speak to about this. Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, you know, I think just from from my parents' um, story, you know, forced me, um, not forced me, um, instilled in me to get back up right and everything I did I, I didn't have a I was fortunate to have a long career but there was a lot of struggles along the way I was released twice as a player uh, got back up went to the big leagues uh, was fired as a manager got back up and, and coached another nine nine ten years in the big leagues and, and won a world series and so I think that spirit a lot of times I do contribute that to my family history you know, to be able to send this is nothing compared to what they went through. And I think a lot of the players, if they're educated on what our, our um, uh, ancestor did, went through and, and uh, you know, my, my greatest probably single story um, in baseball is, is a picture I have of my grandma and grandpa in, in the office in Seattle, I mean, in, in my manager's uniform. You know, that's, that's an amazing uh emotion for me to experience to be able to know that they were in turn um, and gave me the opportunity to, to manage the Seattle Mariners. And after okay, besides those uh, words, I think Haji, H-A-J-I, is ingrained in not only Japanese culture, but Japanese American culture. Um, you know, it's never to bring shame into our family, uh, to uh, always have that gaman, uh, gambateru, that 
uh, spirit, that Dharma doll, you push it down and it bounces back up. Uh, uh, I think uh, all of these, I think even when we talk about players uh, in the 20s, they couldn't play in Major League Baseball, but whenever they got a chance to play with, play with majors or the all-stars of, of the Negro Leagues or all-star blacks, they wanted to prove, you know, they're, they were as good uh, or better. Uh, and the early immigrants that came here and played ball, I, I think it was much more than putting on a baseball uniform was like putting on the American flag. I think they wanted to prove that they were the best immigrant team uh, playing the game. Uh, they had the four or five tools. They had the passion. Maybe they couldn't speak English outside the lines, but inside the lines, baseball is very black and white. If you could play it and play it at a high level, you gain immediate respect. So I think these terms uh, really affected the marginalized, invisible, and for what I call our forgotten ball players that uh, always had to prove that they were as good or even though their size might have been in the media or the color of their skin might have been a detriment, they always wanted to prove they were as good or better than any other immigrant team that came to this country. Just kind of piggyback off that, my uh, my grandpa always uh, always kind of pointed out Wendell Kim and talked about uh, Fibber Hirayama in this way, and we called him Uncle Fibber. So he would say Uncle Fibber and, uh, hey, you know, you, you sprint out to center field. You sprint out to center field. You don't, you don't walk, you don't jog, you sprint. And uh, I know growing up uh, when Wendell Kim was coaching uh, third base for the, for the San Francisco Giants, uh, he would always point out that every once in a while we'd catch you know, um, Fox Sports Bay Area and you'd, you'd catch a glimpse of in between innings as the, as, as the, Giant, as, uh, the Giants were coming in that Wendell Kim would sprint from the dugout to his position at the third base and, and what made a con made always a point to point it out, to notice it because it was about playing the game correctly. It was about playing the game with pride. Um, so I, I took that, took that to heart. It, it was a way that I wanted to play. It was a way that I wanted to be, it was a way that I wanted to, um, in a way, honor the family, but, de but definitely just be that player that would respect it in a way that I would be respected. Great. I think we're at time and Brandon, what you just mentioned really kind of closes out the program really well. Um, Bill, do you want to close out any last remarks or for the group? Yeah, today? sure. Sure. Well, Brandon touched on the word respect. And I mentioned that earlier, respect and opportunity. That's what we're trying to do here. Uh, have the conversation about this rich and important history that needs to be preserved, shared and celebrated. So that's what we're doing here. And there's, we've made uh, great strides, or at least uh, organized baseball has, but there's great opportunities for improvement. Uh, and I think that's kind of uh, what JACL is doing as an organization as well, always advocating uh, for others and creating opportunities. Um, if I could, I just want to uh, connect the dots here. Uh, I think it's really interesting that we're technically coming out of the pandemic, but um, historically Asian Americans have always had a double pandemic of whatever major world event is going on. And, and this new pandemic is no different uh, with the rise of anti-Asian sentiment. And the hashtag was created, uh, stop Asian hate. But I'd like to propose that maybe a more uh, positive approach, not just with that, but even with the conversation we're having here is uh, hashtag start Asian respect. And it's really about respecting the history and creating opportunities for respect uh, et cetera, going forward. So uh, that's it. It's been a wonderful conversation. What an honor and a pleasure to be a part of this. And uh, still a lot of work to do, Carrie. Uh, but we'll uh, continue marching forward and uh, see where the journey takes us, right? Thank you. Yeah. Mahalo, everyone. It's, it's been an honor being in your presence and sharing these uh, stories with you all. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Okay. Hello.